Okay, so welcome to our SLAM webinar. This is webinar six in our series, so this is the final webinar. So welcome to SLAM. By the end of this session, hopefully you'll understand the term SLAM and you'll appreciate the methodologies to achieve a SLAM calibration of seabed transponders. But first of all, what do we think SLAM is? What do you understand SLAM to be at this particular moment in time? Before we go into all the nitty gritty details, what is SLAM? If you've ever Googled it, you'll probably get the definition. It is an acronym, so uh, some of you may be aware of that acronym. So what I want to know, first of all, is what you think SLAM actually is at this particular moment in time. Anybody tell me, put it into the chat or onto the screen. Anybody tell me. No. Oh, there we go. Simultaneous mapping and localization system. Excellent. Yep. So that's the acronym. So S L S L A M is simultaneous localization and mapping. Excellent. Good stuff. So before we go into the nitty gritty details, it's probably worth just having a recap on a couple of things. So last week's in last week's webinar, I left you with a final thought. Okay, so we had these uh, originally we had a full LVL array with five compacts here, and then we had a four compact uh, standard LVL array over here. And what we did is we reduced them down to sparse arrays. So the five compact pentagon shaped array became a triangular three compact array. And then the square shaped array, the four compact array became just a line with two transponders. And notice the orientation of this line here. This is designed so that when the vehicle travels along this particular pipeline, we're gonna get those angles of cut that we talked about before. So we've got an, a, a range from the side and a range from behind as we swing through this area here. And that's going to help to uh, equalize that air ellipse. It's going it's to maintain, maintain a decent air ellipse, which is going to maintain our decent precision of position. Okay, so what I asked you in, the, in last week's webinar is how on earth are we going to calibrate these, these two arrays? We've got, remember the rules of LBL, we need a minimum of four transponders in order to define position, and that's for calibration and tracking. So at the moment in this triangular array, have we got a minimum of four transponders? And in this one, have we got a minimum of four transponders? So what do we think? Can we do baseline calibrations? Put a tick or a thumbs up into the, into the participants tab or just put yes or no into the chat or even fire it onto the screen if you want to. Whatever you want to do. Can we do baseline calibration for these two arrays? Anybody tell me? Tejaswani says no. And so does Sobri. Excellent. Anybody else got anything to say? Can we do baseline calibrations? Okay, we're all going to go with the consensus. So we're going to go with no, we can't. And that is the correct answer. No, we can't do baseline calibrations. We haven't got enough points within each of these arrays in order to define the positions, the references, okay? What about boxings? Can we do boxings? Again, do the same thing. You can put a, uh, a thumbs up or a cross or a, whatever you wanna do, or just put yes into the chat. Can we do boxings for these arrays? Yes, we can. Sobri says yes, Joby says yes, excellent. Okay, yes, we can do boxings. And you can see here, this yellow circle is basically indicating that we, we potentially going to box in this, this first one here. So yes, we can do boxings, but if we just did one like this, this scenario shows you, we're still going to have to <coughs> do some kind of baseline calibration in order to define the other points relative to this, this boxing. Okay, so that's not actually going to help us doing one boxing. But what about more boxings? Potentially we could box in all of them, 
all five compacts in this particular scenario. But is that realistic and is that efficient? If we were in real world, if we we're on the boat, if we we're on the vessel doing, doing a, on our project, is the client going to allow us to do five boxings? Probably not. And the reason being is let's imagine this was deeper water. Imagine the radius that you would have to do at the surface with the surface vessel in order to achieve these boxings. It's going to be quite a large radius if this was, if this was fairly deep water, which means if you've got five fairly large radiuses to cover with the vessel, that's going to take up a hell of a lot of vessel time. Okay, so it's something that a client probably wouldn't allow you to do because it's, it's inefficient to do so. You may as well have just put another transponder on the seabed and just done simple LBL uh, relative calibration. Okay, so yes, we could do boxings, but we're probably not going to because it's inefficient to do so. Okay, but what about this term slam? The reason we're here. Okay, so slam, we could, you can see this one's maintained as a boxing. We could still box one in but then slam the other transponders relative to this first point. Okay, so slam is simultaneous localization and mapping. Exactly as we said before, it's an acronym. Okay, so let's look at that a little bit. What we've got here is an ROV, and let's imagine we've got some walls on the seabed. Okay, the reason I've got these walls on the seabed is because uh, it's basically telling us where SLAM came from. We didn't invent it. Sound Design didn't invent SLAM. It's, it's a term that's been uh, around for a while. It came from the robotics industry. So what they used to do is they used to send a robot into a room and allow it to bump into things within that room. So it could bump into objects. It could bump into the walls. And whilst it's doing that, whilst it's bumping into things, it's, it's learning about its environment. It's learning where things are in that environment, okay? At the same time, it's also trying to localize itself within that environment. So what we're effectively saying is it's simultaneously localizing itself and mapping the environment by bumping into things. So let's say it bumped into the wall, it would move left a bit. If it still bumped into the wall, it, it's starting to map where that wall is. Same with an object, if it hit an object, it could do the same thing. It could start to learn where things are in that room. And then by thinking about where it's been within that room, it's starting to localize itself within that room as well. Okay, but obviously if we, uh, as a subsea positioning specialist, if we sent our, uh, our ROVs down and we asked them to bump into the walls or bump into objects subsea, we're not gonna be very popular. Okay, we could do we could do lots of damage. We could damage the ROVs. We could damage the subsea assets. You know, if this was a structure, we wouldn't be allowed to bump into them. Things like that. That would be a, a, an incident offshore. Okay, so we can't do that. We can't bump into things. So we need to we need some way of uh, of using the systems available to us that we've talked about over the last few weeks, in order to simultaneously localize and map our positions and and our environment. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're not actually going to map our environment. We're going to map the positions of something that you'll see in a minute. Before we do that, let's just have a, a, a recap. We saw this in, the, in some of the last webinars. And this is our plan of our, our house. Okay, what we talked about was that we'd be sat at the kitchen table. Let's imagine it's dark or we've got a blindfold on. And we need to navigate our way safely. To the bathroom okay so as a human being what tools have you got available to you let's imagine it's a really dark uh it's really dark you need to navigate your way to the toilet what tools have you got available to you in order to safely make your way to the bathroom in this particular case what are you going to use put it into the chat or onto the screen what, what information are you going to use and what, what bits and pieces have you got attached to your body, if you like, that's going to help you? Excellent, Ratna. Yeah, you've got hands, haven't you? So you're going to, you're going to feel your way around the room. Okay, so similar to what we saw before with the ROV bumping into things, we're going to bump into things, but we're, we've obviously got hands so we can, we can 
touch. We can touch the walls, we can move along the walls and use that information in order to know how far away we are from certain things. Okay, so our hands are connected to our arms, so we can effectively say that our arms could be similar to the range from a subsea transponder in acoustic terms. Okay, we know how long our arms are, so we know by touching the wall, if we extended our arm at full length, we know how far away from that wall we are. Okay, and as we obviously move closer to things, we can, we'd have to shorten our arm potentially. So that's effectively what SLAM does. It's, it's looking at information that it's getting, range information from subsea transponders in order to estimate position. Okay, so by touching and feeling our way along the walls, we'd, we'd, we'd eventually navigate our way along the, on the hallway here and safely make our way to the bathroom. Okay. Which brings us back to this scenario. So rather than bumping into these walls, let's replace the walls now with our subsea transponders. And we're effectively now going to start to localize ourselves because we've got range information coming in from, from subsea transponders. At the same time, we're going to start to map the positions of these transducers, these, these transponders on the seabed. Okay. So uh, we don't actually map the environment as such, we just map the positions of the transponders in order to give us uh, precise navigation. Okay, and that's basically the principle behind SLAM. Is everybody happy with that? That's, that's what SLAM basically does. Give me a tick or a thumbs up in the, in the participants or just a yes in the chat. Is everybody happy with the concepts that I've been talking about? Excellent, good stuff. Thanks guys. Everybody's following along nicely. Right, so our actual definition at Sonar Line is by combining very precise relative inertial movement with acoustic ranges, we can determine the position, the relative separation, and the orientation of a sparse array or a single transponder. Okay, so we've got this, this INS system, sprint nav system potentially on, on the ROV here. We're feeding range information from our subsea transponders into the Kalman filter of the inertial system. And then we're using that inertial system in order to re-estimate the positions of these subsea transponders. Okay, let's assume this has got a very good position because it's got sprint nav, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the, the, the basic principle behind it is over here, we've got an ROV with a known position. So how it came to that known position is, is uh, dependent on what systems they had in place in the first place in this particular case. So they may have a USB L system, in which case they could they could kick off the INS dead reckoning with USB L. Uh, once they're at the seabed, they might have a DVL, so they get bottom lock, which is going to give them a really really nice precise position once they've got bottom lock and USB L feed and pressure. Don't forget they've got a pressure sensor feeding them for, for the Z uh, the Z um, estimation. Okay, if they haven't got a USB L system they could utilize another transponder on the seabed. Okay, it might be a known position. It might be a subsea transponder that's, that's been uh, uh, reconnected to a, comp, uh, a structure, repopulated a, a bucket on a structure. That probably has a published position, so it's, it's a known coordinate, and they could use that in order to position the vehicle in range aiding mode. Okay, so whatever position you've got here, it's a known position, it's a good position. As long as it's going to keep dead reckoning running for the INS, that is sufficient enough to start this process. Okay, over here, you can see we've got an uncalibrated seabed transponder. Okay, it's, it's the one we've just deployed. Okay, so we've got ROV with known position, we've got a deployed subsea transponder. We deployed that probably using the USBL system if we've got one. And what we took from the USBL was an initial drop position, exactly as we would with, a, with an LBL system. Okay, so we've got an initial drop position with an important part. It's the error estimate. <coughs> okay, so not only do we send the initial drop position to the, to the INS initially, we also send the error estimate associated with that initial drop position. And this is quite important because this is what the Kalman filter in the, uh, in the INS is going to use as its starting point, 
the estimation of position. So it's, it's effectively how confident we think we are in this position. We're going to tell the camel filter in the INS that we are that confident in that position. Okay, and that's, going to, that's what it's going to use that as a starting point. We're then going to run some kind of trajectory. Okay, because we're only using ranges here, we're not, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not like a USBL system. We can't calculate angles and bearings and things like that. This is still a range range system. So we need to do some kind of trajectory in order to collect a sufficient amount of ranges at uh, a sufficient geometry, uh, a range of, of, of uh, different angles in order to define position for something. Okay, so we're going to run a straight line trajectory in this particular case. And what you'll basically see the process is when we get our first range from over here, the first thing you'll see is that the initial drop position will shift to the length of the range. Okay, and then what you'll also see is that the air ellipse responds to the direction of the range, exactly as we've been talking about before. You know, the, 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 the air ellipse is constrained in the direction of the range. Okay, the semi major axis of this air ellipse will be the same as our initial air estimate for the first range that we get. Okay, so first thing that happens is the position shifts to the length of the range. We get an air ellipse associated with it with the direction of the range because we're fairly confident in this in this two-way travel time assuming sound speeds correct and all that sort of stuff uh, and then we need to do some kind of trajectory in order to start to refine this position so we're fairly confident in this direction because that's the direction of the range so if you think about this uh, that we want to constrain in, in in multiple directions in order to, to refine this part of the air ellipse that's what we're going to do Okay, so this elongated bit, we need to do that straight line trajectory in order to start to constrain this side of the air ellipse. Okay, because so obviously eventually we want to make an air ellipse equal. So we move along, we do our trajectory, we get another range. This time the air ellipse shrinks slightly because we're now more confident in the position of this transponder. And it also, um, uh, may move it may move still okay it may move may shift it slightly so the slam algorithm may may shift the subsea transponder uh, each time it gets a range until it's fairly confident that's that's where the transponder actually is then we move again and we get another range again the error shrink and it's, it's starting to get to a level where it's really confident in, in the position so in summary in a more dynamic sense Imagine we're ranging and ranging. We're not just taking three or four ranges. We're taking lots of ranges. As we swing by in our straight line trajectory in this particular case, we're going to get to a certain point where we've covered enough area in order to be very confident in the position of this transponder in, in all directions. So we've equalized the air ellipse. Okay. And this straight line trajectory is what we'd call a two-dimensional slam or a 2D slam. And that is effectively utilizing the SLAM algorithm in order to define horizontal position of our subsea transponder. And what we've effectively done is we've covered an area greater than 60 degrees, which has given us a sufficient angle of cut, enough information, enough range information over 60 degrees in order to define uh, a better estimate of the transponder location. Okay, you'll notice there's a 150 meter offset. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, that's to do with our depth error. Okay. So, is everybody happy with the concept so far? Is is everybody happy with what two-dimensional slam is? Two-dimensional slam is basically moving the ROV relative to a subsea transponder, collecting range information in order to define its horizontal position. Give me a thumbs up or a tick, just in the in the in the participants tab or a yes in the chat excellent good stuff okay so i've just talked about that 150 meter offset okay so in the in the straight line trajectory we are 150 meters minimum of 150 meters away from the subsea transponder as we swing by it and the reason for that is is to uh, reduce any depth error in the system. 
Okay, so what you can see here is uh, when, we, when we're calculating depth, we take a slant range and we can uh, utilize the depth information in the system in order to make that into a horizontal range so that we know how far away we are in horizontal terms. Okay, but if there was any depth error, let, let's take the example of an INS range aided system initially. If there was any depth error in this subsea transponder. If we took the slant range, the two way time of flight would be whatever it is, whatever it's calculated based on sound speed. But if there was a depth error at this end and we were close enough to it, that would translate into a horizontal shift in our INS position. Okay, so you'd effectively see this. Let's imagine we had a depth error. What it does is it pushes the horizontal position of the INS incorrectly. Okay, because the two way time of flight would remain the same. Okay, but what we're doing is that we're obviously estimating this end utilizing the INS. So the principle remains the same. Because we're estimating this, we need to maintain a fairly decent distance away in order to reduce the effect of any depth error. Okay, the same rules apply in LBL usually. The, the, the further you are away from uh, the subsea transponder, the less effect any depth error is going to have on the position of the vehicle. Okay, so if you can get these longer, longer ranges, but still maintain efficiency, that's going to be best for the, for the position estimate of, of this end as well when we're, when we're talking about slab. Say so just an example, just to, just to give you some numbers. If we had a one kilometer slant range and there was a one meter depth error, that would effectively equate to a one centimeter horizontal range error. Okay, so any estimates that we're making over, over a kilometer, if there was a one meter depth error, would only equate to about a one centimeter error in the position estimate. Okay, but let's make that a shorter range. Let's make that a 50 meter range. We're still going to maintain that one meter depth error, but look what it does to the horizontal range error. That's going to make it a 20 centimeter error, which means that we're going to, that's effectively going to enter our system. That's going to enter our SLAM algorithm. And so if we're trying to estimate, re-estimate the position of this transducer, we could potentially have a 20 centimeter depth error, uh, 20 centimeter uh, horizontal position error if we get too close. Okay. So the whole reason we do that 150 meters is because it still maintains efficiency. You know, if we went to one kilometer, that's a hell of a distance away in order to do these, uh, do these uh, calibrations. So 150 meters is far enough away to maintain a reasonable amount of range, horizontal range error. So if there is any depth error in the system, 150 meters is effectively saying that we're definitely going to achieve better than 20 centimeters in our horizontal position estimate. So when we're talking about SLAM, we're effectively less than 20 centimeters in our position estimate. Okay, does that all make sense to people? So basically in summary, we're, we're just using this in order to reduce, we're, we're, we're doing these 150 meter offsets in order to reduce our error estimate, uh, any, any depth error effect in our position estimate. Does that make sense to everyone? Just give me a thumbs up or a tick. Or yes or no. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, guys. Brilliant. Right. Let's move on. So, just in summary, this is a video. Uh, apologies if it's a bit clunky. We're running it over a network, obviously, but uh, this is basically showing you with uh, a 2D slam. Okay. So, we've got an ROV swinging by our transponders and it's fixing their positions as it's, as it's covering that 60 degree angle of cut that we talked about. Okay. Notice we've got 150 meter offset and we're five meters above. Okay, so this is, this is quite possible, and we've been doing this in, in various places across the globe already. Uh, we're calibrating these long lines of transponders just by doing a two-dimensional slab. Notice there's an F2, F2, Fusion 2. This can only be done in our Fusion 2 software in real time. Okay. So we've just talked about reducing the depth error estimate in a two-dimensional SLAM, but we can also use the SLAM algorithm to define depth. Okay, so to define depth and horizontal position, we call this a 3D SLAM. Okay, so a 3D SLAM is, uh, in order to define depth in a 3D SLAM, we're going to take ranges from away from the transponder, 
and over the top or as close to over the top as we can get still maintaining line of sight to the subsea uh, to the to the rod nerve transducer on the top of the vehicle okay and the reason we're going away and over the top is because we need a big vertical change we need a big vertical change for the camel filter to observe in order to refine the estimate for this transducer here okay so we're refining depth est uh, estimate for the transducer so by taking ranges away and over the top we've got this big vertical element that's observable to the camel filter in the INS and that allows it to estimate depth uh, to, a, to a high level Okay, and what we came up with with, uh, with a trajectory that you could run sub C, we did lots of early tests with this, and, and this was the best that we came up with that's, that's easily manageable for an ROV with its tether uh, and all that sort of stuff. So that you can see we've got this offset circle. Sub C transponder is here. We've got this offset circle, and the closest we get is, is five meters. As, so we're, what we're going to do is basically start here at the back of the circle. We're going to swing in, we're going to come within five meters, ideally we'd go over the top, but because the, uh, the Robnav transducer is on top of the vehicle, we can't go over the top. So we, we, we maintain this five meter distance, which is perfectly adequate in order to define this, this, this depth estimate. Okay, so we'd swing by, and then we'd go back round to our starting point. And one circle would be enough in order to, to, to refine both depth and position. Because not only are we estimating depth by taking ranges away and over the top or as close to over the top as we can get, we've also got this angle of cut, this 60 degree cone that we've achieved with the radius of this circle. This is typically a 40 meter radius circle. So the ROV would maintain its heading, do a 40 meter radius circle. That would give you the angle of cut, the 60 degree, in order to, to define position. And we've also gone away, collecting ranges and over the top in order to refine depth. Okay, so that's 3D SLAM. If you saw it in the software, and this is Fusion 2 software, again, you can only do this in Fusion 2 in real time. So ROV is doing its offset circle. We're gonna swing by closest point of five meters. We've got a horizontal estimate going on here and a depth estimate going on here. So you can see the depth comes right down as we swing over the top. And on the screen here, you can see there's this fan appearing, which is where we're getting decent range information into the Kalman filter. So you can see that's likely to end up as a, a nice 60 degree cone, which is enough information to, do, to refine our horizontal position of our transponder. Okay. That's what it would look like in, in freeze frame. Okay, so horizontal estimate here, depth estimate here. This is an indication of how far the subsea transponder has moved based on the drop location that we initially gave it. Which brings us back to our scenario. Okay, so I asked you how on earth we'd calibrate this. We talked about SLAM. So the process we're likely to go through is we box in the first one because it's, it's useful to have a known coordinate on the seabed in order to kick off the INS and dead reckoning and all that sort of stuff. Okay, and we can also position everything relative to that once we kick, kick this process off. But you wouldn't necessarily need to box in a compact. As I said before, it might be a repopulated structure compact with a known coordinate. Okay, so in this particular case, we're going to use range information from this initial transponder we're going to 3D slam our first transponder that we put on the seabed. Ranging to all of them, we're going to fix this one in 3D. Then we're going to position our next one, ranging to all of them. Then we're going to move on to the next one. We may fix this one. And use the range information from all three of these to position these two in 3D, 3D slam. Uh, the slam algorithm has a maximum of three transponders in it at any one time. So obviously this one we would have to fix at some point in order to calibrate these three, these further three. Okay, and that's why I said we might fix this one or we might leave it in the SLAM algorithm whilst we go and do these two because we've got the maximum then of three in the SLAM computation. Okay, not to say you have to do that, but that's, that's the limitation currently. Okay. So that's basically how we'd calibrate our triangular array 
and our line here. And as you saw before, we could do a long line of transponders quite happily using this, this type of technology. Is everybody happy with that so far before I just talk about a real world example? Just give me a thumbs up or a tick. That's, a, that's a, basically the process of a 3D slam, how you would tackle that problem that we talked about. Excellent, everybody's happy with that. Good stuff. Okay, let's just finally touch on a real world example. Uh, metrology is a good place to go because it is a highly precise uh, task to do sub C. So we did a comparison between a, a full acoustic metrology and a slam metrology, and we got very, very decent results as comparison. So what we've got here is our, you know, we're going to put our connecting piece between the two structures. This is what we call a point to point metrology. So we've probably got a gyro compact here and a gyro compact here. The reason the gyro compact is because we want to collect pitch and roll information and heading information in order to, to, to complete the metrology. But what we can use the SLAM algorithm for is to define the distance between these two points because we can define the horizontal positions and we can also define the depth using the SLAM algorithm. So ROV would run a series of trajectories. In this particular case it's doing a big circle, collecting ranges all the way around these two transponders. And what we'd also do is a smaller circle here where we go over the top or as close to over the top as we can in order to define the depth. Okay, so we do a 3D slam here and then we do a trajectory here to define horizontal position. Which would give us our metrology results. Uh, this is the results that you see. So we did the trajectory around the outside, two smaller circles to define depth and the results you can see over here. So Compared to a conventional metrology, this is our horizontal distance. We only had a, dis a difference of eight millimeters. And our depth difference compared to our conventional metrology was only 16 millimeters. So it's incredibly, uh, incredibly competitive. You know, and we've, uh, you can see in the picture here, there's two other transponders in a braced quad network. So we compared it against the full conventional braced quad metrology that you're likely to see most commonly used. So just to conclude, why would you use sparse LBL and SLAM? So just to, just to finalize this whole series really, is in, when we're using these systems, there's an incredible amount of vessel time saved because we've, we've got less transponders. The time saved to calibrate these things is, is, uh, is, is a lot. You know, we've saved a lot of time, deployment uh, time, calibration time and all that sort of stuff. So it's incredible amount of vessel time saved, which is money. To the, to the end client, you know, they've saved a lot of money. We can do these large footprints, so we can spread these arrays out quite, quite large, large areas and still maintain capability to, to, to calibrate them quite happily, utilizing the systems we've got with fewer compacts, obviously. 100% line of sight of compacts is not necessary, so, you know, we can, we can dip behind structures, we can, we can, we can travel longer distances between transponder updates and we still maintain a fairly high precision. It's fast and simple to mobilize so we've got these, these, these systems that we can mobilize onto an ROV and the current spread that we use is a, is, a, is, is a sprint nav with one connection to the top side because it's got a pressure sensor and a Doppler built in and the connection for the ROV nav is just one connection with power and comms into the top of the sprint nav. So it's very, very simple to set up. INS can become a standard fit on the ROV. So what we've started doing at Sonodyne is rather than um, uh, going to survey companies with, with, with these systems, we actually go to the source. So we go to the ROV team, uh, the ROV manufacturers and the AUV manufacturers, and we, and we fit these systems as standard so that across the board, anybody that's using that, that particular system has the capability to do this, this type of technology. So money saved in removal and replacement costs for the, for the, the, the end user, you know, the, the, the survey company may save a lot of money themselves because they haven't got to remobilize all these systems all the time because they're a standard fit on the vehicles themselves. So it also provides greater ROV capabilities. So you've got these ROVs that have, they've got these 
highly advanced systems in place constantly, which means that it's that it's improving the RV capability from, from the offset. And then finally, faster update rates of position and sensor data with wideband three and fusion two. Uh, we haven't talked too much about this, or well, we have in, in previous webinars, but not today, but, but obviously by coming on a training course and, and, and you're gonna learn about all these advantages that come from using wideband three and fusion two and, and how that ties into SLAM and, and, and our sparse networks and that sort of stuff. So we've improved the efficiency of, of everything across the board using these systems. Which brings us to the end of the webinar. So hopefully by now you understand what SLAM is and you appreciate the methodologies to achieve a SLAM calibration of seabed transponders. Just to recap, we've, we've been through the whole webinar series. We've just finished webinar six. So that is the conclusion of the series. So excellent. It's been a pleasure delivering it all. If you want any more information on uh, our training courses, we are going to be running full training courses uh, starting in June. And that's LBL courses uh, and INS courses and Ranger 2 USBL courses. So we are in the process of doing online uh, conversions and they will uh, be ready in June. So if you want any information on those, contact us at training on the website or on LinkedIn or Twitter, or you can email us at training at zonaline.com. Thank you for your time and stay safe.